welcome back to the second of these uh, reflections for our Bible study for September, looking at uh, how we might respond to violence. And uh, last time we looked at the book of Lamentations, and I said the hook in particular uh, was that verse which says, It is good, within the context of the third chapter of the book of Lamentations, to turn one's cheek to the smiter. And we take that up today in uh, Matthew 5, uh, the start of the Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus says, amongst other things, uh, you have heard it said that uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. You can see very similar themes uh, coming through. But let's start with understanding the context to this chapter. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is uh, given uh, exactly that. Up on the Mount, uh, Jesus has gone up the mountain. He's trying to come with his disciples, those whom he's only just called. He called them in verse uh, 4.18 as he walked by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew. Uh, so this is one of the very first things that Jesus does with uh, his new group of disciples. Uh, but they have seen him uh, travel, preach, teach, perform miracles, drive out unclean spirits, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then he takes them uh, up to the mountain uh, and tries to tell them what sort of kingdom he is coming to proclaim. And it looks as though uh, he's particularly trying to speak to the disciples. Uh, 5.1. He sat down, his disciples came to him, and then he began to speak uh, and taught them, saying. So although there are other crowds, it looks like he's trying to speak uh, specifically to the disciples. Compare that to Luke, where uh, his version has... Uh, the disciples uh, in the sort of inner circle, but Jesus is much more aware that the crowd uh, is listening in on this. Uh, Matthew seems to have Jesus speak specifically uh, to those whom he's called uh, to follow him, to learn from him, uh, to be those whom he commissions uh, to carry on with this teaching uh, and healing ministry. And uh, the the Sermon on the Mount begins with this very famous passage that we call the Beatitudes. Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. So you can immediately see him set out here his... Uh, his manifesto, it's sometimes called, his <coughs> agenda, his vision for a people who will not meet violence with violence, but will, will try to spread his gospel of peace, uh, of humility, uh, of learning to be people who experience the ups and downs of life, uh, who can come alongside those who are in places of darkness, pain, uh, victimisation, and help transform those. Now that word blessed in the Greek makarios is, is an interesting word. It's not the same blessed we had in the letter to the Ephesians in August. Uh, that was uh, eulogetos. This is a, a more sort of be happy, be content. Uh, be joyful with your situation. Uh, so this isn't this isn't a sort of uh, a blessing prayer that that we might see in other places. This is about our human experience. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Happy, content are the poor in spirit with the world, but not in a a, a sort of hedonistic way uh, that we should enjoy suffering, but that we should recognise. Uh, be humble enough to accept that the world is a challenging place and that God is present in the poverty and pain of the world. And he follows that section, he follows the Beatitudes uh, with this statement, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Again, uh, passages which come, come up time and time again are preached on uh, so often. But I think we can see here, this is how Jesus is saying, 
you can be influential, you can be countercultural, you can be transformative about the culture and society in which you are set without being confrontational. Uh, that's the point of salt. Uh, it's present in the bread without challenging or driving out any of the other components, but completely transforming uh, its texture, its flavour, uh, how it is formed. Uh, and the same with light. It transforms our experience of the world without removing uh, anything, even the bad stuff, but allowing us to see it for what it really is. So I think that's what this, this salt and light is. It's about being transformative without being combative. Uh, and that's, uh, that's where we are with our response uh, to violence in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, goes on, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Because having started with that, uh, that vision, you can see his disciples go, well, well, what is the point of all this uh, structure of, of law? But not only that, those prophecies which say God will be just, God will uh, drive out the enemies, God will uh, avenge wrongdoing. And Jesus says, yeah, I don't come to get rid of that, um, but I come to transform it. Because that's about judgment. And I think what Jesus is doing is trying to challenge our understanding of judgment. I saying, well, this is right and this is wrong. Because that can lead to division. And we see this in the world around us. Therefore, to violence, to try to assert our own viewpoint violently uh, at the exclusion of anything that challenges that world view. No, Jesus says, it's not that I come to, to exclude judgment, but I want you to think about it in a very different way. And he goes on to give some very particular examples then about, uh, about some of the things that his disciples will know well, we know well from uh, the, the commandments that are at the very heart of the law and the prophets, the Ten Commandments. So he talks about murder, he talks about adultery, uh, he talks about honouring parents. And he says this, uh, in this passage concerning anger, uh, look in particular at verse 23. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that someone has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled to them. Again, notice it's not if you have something against someone else, if it's someone else has something against you. And in terms of our thinking about victimhood, that can be a really challenging thing. This is an opportunity to build trust in our relationships. This is, is what we're talking about when we talk about safeguarding in church. If someone has something against you, that puts you in a position of vulnerability uh, because I could come up with some spurious charge and that means that, that you know, you've got to, to leave your position of worship to God uh, and go and sort that out first. So what we're saying there is we're putting ourselves in a position of humility and vulnerability because we trust those with whom we are in relationship when it comes to forming community. That's what this is about. It's about forming trust, building up a, a system of justice and judgment built on mutual respect, mutual understanding, mutual dignity, because we recognise the place of everybody within this society that we're building. But there is space then in verse 25 uh, to, for, for this language about your accuser to, to creep in. Now, uh, your accuser, well, in Hebrew, uh, the word for uh, an accuser is uh, hasatana. Uh, that's where the Greek satanos, Satan, comes from. Uh, and I think that's quite deliberate. This is a spiritualised way of understanding how our community forms. Sometimes we do get that that influence uh, of somebody, something 
trying to accuse us, trying to make us be guilty, trying to, to distract, tempt us uh, away from seeing the good. And Jesus says here we have an opportunity uh, to come to terms with that. And he says do it quickly so that you can return to worship, so that you can return to service, so that you can turn to, to build up uh, those communities of, of love and mutual respect that I'm encouraging you to do. So he says, settle your account uh, with your accuser. Uh, again, this is at the very beginning of his ministry. He's just beginning to introduce this language with the disciples uh, so that we can then build on that later on uh, and when we get to, to language around the cross about him paying the price for our sin it's because he's already introduced this language about uh, being accused settling uh, the debt of sin uh, he's doing that now and building up that picture for us and that's what that's what all these uh, these sort of real life examples are about they're about saying uh, what is important is not so much uh, the external action, the, the virtue signalling, we might say in, in modern language, um, but the inclinations of our hearts that are at the root of that decision making. Um, so he says, uh, um, you know, you've heard it said you shall not murder, but I say to you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. Or later, you've heard uh, it said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What matters is the inclinations in our hearts at the roots of our decision making and that comes to a culmination uh, in verse 37 so he says let your word be yes yes or no no anything more than this comes from the evil one again this language uh, of something turning us away driving us away from rightful action uh, again remember Jesus has only just been uh, in Matthew's gospel in the desert, facing his own temptations, uh, facing the devil himself. Uh, so, so I think he's he's introducing this this language, this spiritual struggle, uh, to his disciples. Um, but that that yes, yes or no, no. I think that's that's important when we're thinking about our actions. Don't don't try to to dress up our actions to be something uh, they're not. Allow our actions to reveal the reasons for why we serve one another, why uh, we deal peaceably in the way that we do, because at the heart is our desire to serve, love and worship God and not to be turned away from doing the right thing. And that I think therefore is, is what is at the heart of uh, verses 38 onwards. Uh, when Jesus says, so I say to you, do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. A visible action that demonstrates to everybody our disposition towards humility, a disposition uh, towards transforming situations of violence in unexpected ways. Now there are lots of uh, of different ways people have tried to interpret this verse about uh, well if someone strikes you on the uh, the right cheek they have to use a backhand so so you're um, forcing them to use the the front of their hand the palm of their hand by striking on the left cheek. Um, uh, that may be true uh, but I think it's it's more simple than that it is simply um, you're challenging that virtue signaling someone strikes you on the cheek we've we said uh, in the last reflection that that's uh, somebody trying to mock you uh, insult you possibly as a prelude um, to other forms of violence uh, but that's the virtue signaling at the start of this campaign of violence which says uh, you know I'm in control I have the power uh, building up that, that situation of, of victimhood, that experience of victimhood uh, to be demonstrable uh, to, to everyone around them. And when we think of violence, 
uh, acts of violence, that is very often the case. People are doing it to be seen to be violent, to get across their point, uh, to say, uh, I'm, I'm claiming the high ground here to show you that I believe I'm right. Uh, and by, um, by allowing uh, that mockery, that humiliation to continue, I think what Jesus is trying to say is, uh, don't allow somebody to take control through violence. It's challenging that virtue signalling in a, in a challenging and subvertive way. It's not easy because because we we understand what what victimhood does to people, and and again as we saw in Lamentations, I don't think we're supposed to think that um, being hurt is a good thing, uh, but I think I think we are supposed to think that meeting violence with violence is not good. And of course, Jesus embodies that perfectly by allowing himself to be uh, humiliated, degraded, tortured, killed on the cross and transforming that into new life. So that ultimately is, is where we're going. It's not that being hurt is good, but that meeting with violence with violence is not good. Uh, ultimately, then, uh, Jesus sums it up. Uh, 545 I say to you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that is what is going to challenge and transform structures of oppression and violence is love and prayer which can sound trite but it's not if you look at if you look at where Jesus uh, has come from that's why you've got to read uh, these verses in context it's not just about um you know say a prayer and everything will be all right it's about praying earnestly because you recognize that God is present in these situations uh, of of pain and that, that is a really challenging thing for a lot of religious perspectives to hear. God is present in our pain. Pain is not a punishment for sin. Pain is not a, a, a demonstration of God's abandonment. Quite the opposite. It's a demonstration that God wants to transform our inclination to sin and evil and oppression and violence into something much better and as i said at the start uh, this this um, vision for his kingdom is being delivered to the disciples whom he's calling to follow him to say right this is what my kingdom is going to look like many people were expecting a messiah the christ to come uh, to to challenge political structures and to be a, a revolutionary who was going to drive out uh, corrupt oppressive Roman structures, uh, transform the, the corrupt Jewish authorities, uh, but he doesn't do that. He lives into his uh, messianic status, role, in a very different way to that which the crowds uh, are expecting. And I think that's uh, that's why he sets out this vision to his disciples at the very start of that their ministry. So he's saying to them, if you follow me, if we follow Jesus, this is what we're signing up to, to be peacemakers and not to be uh, a zealous, violent, revolutionary group of which uh, the the that area uh, of the world had seen plenty and has seen plenty uh, even in recent times and that uh, at the end of this chapter 5 uh, of the of Matthew's gospel of the sermon on the mount uh, you know that is what it means to be more than a, a tax collector a gentile uh, more than, than somebody who's part of these earthly regimes but but actually to be part uh, of a much bigger greater uh, all encompassing movement which is the kingdom of God, a kingdom built uh, on love and peace. 
Now, there's two more chapters of Matthew's Gospel which uh, include the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I wasn't going to look at those in this reflection, just focusing on chapter 5. But I just wanted to acknowledge that by the time we get to the end of chapter 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as one of their scribes. We realise that the crowds are listening. I said before, in Matthew's Gospel, this is spoken specifically to the disciples, but others are listening in too. Others are finding this teaching so attractive that they're drawn into that relationship with Jesus too. Uh, and that that is what this, this vision is about. It's about having that desire for good on our hearts in all the decisions that we make and not a desire for evil uh, that that the accuser the evil one might introduce for us where does that desire come from well it comes from the authority of Jesus an authority built uh, on love an authority built on the recognition that Jesus is the one who loves us who loves those who are opposed to him who ultimately uh, challenged violence uh, and oppression by bringing not violence but a completely new recreation uh, of of peaceful uh, and joyful living. So I hope you've you found something there in the the Sermon on the Mount in chapter five. Uh, which again can help you understand an appropriate response to violence and how some of these verses uh, are in the context of Jesus' vision for a new way of living. Next time uh, we look at how some of his disciples put that into practice as we look uh, at Acts, verse uh, 432 through to the end of chapter 5. Thank you.